All right, Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3. Brother Pip, that's in the New Testament, so I just... <laughs> Colossians chapter 3. It, you, yes, you absolutely can. There's, um, actually, that, you know, uh, we dissed on each other because I think everybody in here knows pretty much, but in the front of your Bible, it tells you, hey, this is where you can find this book, and it will give you a page number. And uh, that has been helpful to uh, folks in the past. So um, I want to uh, preach this morning, teach, preach, talk, whatever you want to take it as. But um, uh, I don't know that I'll rant or rave. And every time I say that, I end up ranting or raving about something. But I'll try to stay on point this morning. But, um, uh, oh, I don't want to, I'm not trying to chastise anybody. And I'm not, listen, the great thing about churches is, uh, if, if, if everything goes according to plan and your heart's in the right condition, uh, you should be able to come to church, um, hear something from the preacher, and let, let's take it from a, let's take it from a, everybody okay? What was that? It was you? Oh, Miss Crystal up there getting mad at what I'm already talking about, huh? No, if you, <laughs> if you come to church and you're like, let's just use the terminology that we can all just understand. You're not right with God, okay? Let's just, we're not right with God. And you say, all right, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna come in there anyway. The walls may fall down on me, but I'm gonna go in anyway. And you go in and you sit down and you hear something and it goes, uh, and it pricks your heart or it, or, it, or it hurts your feelings, so to speak, in a non-offensive way. But you, 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 you like, oh man, that, that got me. That, oh man. The, the correct thing is, is you don't, I don't want to be the type of pastor or have the type of church where people who aren't right with God come to church and they get filleted and they walk out feeling worse than when they walked in. Man, I know I'm not right with God. That guy just stood up there for 45 minutes telling me, and Paul's like, we're here for 45 minutes? No, we, uh, uh, <laughs> um, uh, and you walk out going, I'm not coming back next week. Or man, I don't want to go back next week. I know Brother Jake had good intentions, but God, the way the, if you'll let your heart work this way, and, 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 and I've prayed myself up and I've said, oh God, use me. And, and uh, you walk in and you get your heart pricked and you feel convicted. You walk out. Yes, you feel convicted, but you walk out saying, okay, but his mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness and God will let me start from where I am. And, and, there's, and, and there's light at the end of the tunnel. I do not want to be a pastor or have a church where you walk out and you walked in doom and gloom, and you walk out with more doom and more gloom. That's not, not what I want. But I also am not going to be a pastor, the Bible says, who tickles their ears. Well, I know the big tithers sit over there, so I don't want to touch on what I know about them. And I know these people over there just gave some money to missions, so I don't want to touch on anything about them. Tiptoeing through the tithers, no. Nope. We're going to lay out truth, and I'm going to let the Holy Spirit of God do his work. And if it touches your heart, it touches your heart. And um, uh, let the Lord talk to you, because I don't follow you around with a camera throughout the week. Thank goodness. people. I would never be on a reality TV show. Get that camera out of my face. No. Um, no, you're not following me around. I don't want you to see what I said or what I... No, 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 no. But even more invasive, oh, there may, no be, there, there may not be a camera walking around, you know following us around, recording everything we do. But if you're a born-again Christian and you have the Holy Spirit of God who says the Comforter, who I spoke the last two weeks about, the Comforter comes to live with us, he's here. And the Bible says that he, even, he knows our thoughts. He knows our thoughts. He knows our feelings. And he, here's the neat thing about the Holy Spirit, though. He's not judging us, going, Ugh. he's not a... a um, uh, you know, a, bail, a, a, a jailer there with a, you know, thumping us in the head. He's not there to keep us in line. He's there to help guide us and comfort us and convict us and help us, encourage us. That's what he's there for. So um, I want to speak this morning, preach this morning on sanctify the secular. Sanctify, sanctify means to set apart or make holy, make it special. Sanctify the secular. Well, what's secular? Secular is life outside of anything religious. Uh, here, here you, it's used in, um, uh, as an adjective, secular, denoting attitudes, activities, or other things that have no religious or spiritual basis. Now, for the Christian, everything can have a spiritual basis. The secular world can have spiritual basis. 
Carnal cannot. Carnal cannot. We cannot sanctify um, going to the club. <laughs> we cannot sanctify cussing out our neighbor. Brother Pip. We cannot, uh, apparently I touched a funny bone. Uh, you know, uh, we, <laughs> we, can't, we cannot sanctify holding a grudge. You understand? We can't sanctify those things. I have a problem. I know I do. And, and, and Brother Alex, I don't know if he... I don't, he probably didn't even know us yesterday, but some guy, we we're trying to get in the left lane and my left turn signals out, which I'm trying, well, I'm going to fix today. And I needed to get over and this guy was being ridiculous, you know? So I got over. I did not cut him off. There's plenty of space, but then I got over in the left turning lane. And he wanted to drive by and stare at me. Look, man, I'm not the one, not today, <laughs> not maybe tomorrow. When I'm meek and kind, Sunday morning, find me at church, you'll find me. Man, that guy's like Jesus. He's got a good sense of humor. He's kind. He's handsome. He's funny. He's good. No. Of course, of course, I, I kid. But he's staring at me. Want to mean mug me. Look, dude, go on about your business. Go on about your way. I don't know if you paid attention to it at all, but I'm like, you don't want this. Okay. I'll send Alex on you. Um, you don't want any of this. I... I I didn't want to, I know, I, I didn't have time for that. I didn't want to do that. I can't hold or I can't act like a, a dummy in traffic. I drive a big old semi truck, big old truck. Um, and I haul all kinds of stuff, all kinds of stuff. And people, they cut in front of you all the time. They just cut in front of you, cut in front of you, like, like tr semi trucks aren't there or they can stop on a dime. Um, if you, if you want to die quick in traffic, mess with a semi truck. Uh, and I'm not kidding from driving it. Uh, I'm, I've seen all the stuff that's going on with railroads. I mean, folks, don't cross railroad. Don't stop on railroad tracks. Why didn't the train slow down? People didn't pay attention in, in, in class. It's called physics and momentum and weight and stopping distance. It takes over a mile for those things to stop, depending on their speed. Um, and then we're not even talking about all the infrastructure. Everybody's thinking all these trains collapsing is some sort of um, uh, conspiracy. Hey, maybe it is, but we have spent zero, very, very little money on American infrastructure. Uh, we've given, what, uh, nearly a billion dollars or more to Ukraine? Uh, but we've, what are we doing on our infrastructure? Now, I'm not talking politics today. I'm talking secular. Let's get back. Secular. Secular. Our jobs. Secular. Um, uh, our, our daily lives. Sanctify the secular. Now, uh, the curse of the century in which we live um, and the times in which we live is um, the idea of Sunday morning religion. Just Sunday morning religion. I was talking to a coworker and he said, you know, we have a, a lot of people at first service. They don't have Sunday morning, Sunday night church. They have first service, second service. Um, and he said, man, a whole lot of people come to first service. You know, very few come to second service. And I asked about midweek stuff and whatnot. You know, churches are just, they do things their own way. We're an independent church. They're an independent church. Do it however you want, as long as it's, you know, biblical basis. And um, uh, I was picking up some kids on a bus for uh, the, our bus ministry a couple of years ago. And I was watching everybody get up. And it was man, 8 o'clock, 8.30. And they were all filing into uh, uh, this Catholic church, you know, on, over in uh, the... Uh, Spring, uh, what is that? Sherman Street area. And uh, just kind of filing in. And I always, I like to evaluate. I like to watch. Um, uh, I like to, to not sit around and judge people, but look at people and wonder why they're doing what they're doing or why is it that, uh, you know, what, what's so attractive about this? Maybe they grew up in the Catholic Church or um, maybe they really think it is true. Um, and all the Catholics that I have known to come to repentance turn around and go, man, we had the wool pulled over our eyes. We had no, we had no clue. Um, you won't find in the Bible where it says salvation is found in the Catholic Church or the Presbyterian Church, or for that matter, salvation is not found. Um, I'll say this by the Baptist Church. You, you most likely will find it in the Baptist Church. We have gospel tracts laying all over this place. Bibles laying all over this place. The gospel is put everywhere. The gospel of Jesus Christ. You'll find salvation in Jesus Christ. You won't find it in some other entity. You find it in Jesus. Now. What has gotten to uh, America is Sunday morning religion because many people, many people practice only their religion on Sunday morning. No matter what that religion is, they usually practice it on Sunday morning here in America. 
um, we should come to church to worship God on Sunday, but we ought to bring our worship to church. Get that. You shouldn't just come to church to worship. You ought to bring your worship with you. And when we leave the building, take our worship with us. Take it out. Now, the Bible teaches that when we're right with God, every day is a holy day. When we're right with God, every day is a holy day, and every act is a holy act or a sacred act or deed, and everything we do, the Bible says, do to the glory of God. Go, uh, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Verse 16. Uh, talking about putting on the new man, but the Bible says in verse 16 of Colossians 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as, is, uh, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. You see, we serve the Lord Christ. I don't care where you work, you serve the Lord. You serve the Lord. One way that's tried to help me adapt driving a truck, I gotta tell you, I don't like it. I don't like driving 11 hours a day. I don't like sleeping in the truck for 10 hours. I don't, I don't like all that. I don't like what all that entails. But to help me and help my mind, I don't work for um, uh, Tipman Associates. I work for Jesus. I drive a truck for Jesus. If you paint, you should paint for Jesus. If you um, uh, go to school, go to school for Jesus. Uh, if you work in a factory, work in the factory for Jesus. Whatsoever you do, whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. You're doing it for the Lord. But he goes into every instance. Husbands and wives and children, the family unit. Serving each other like we would serve the Lord. Serving each other like we would serve the Lord. Doing uh, our work and everything that we do as unto the Lord. Now, the Bible teaches that when we're right with God, every day is a holy day. Every day is a holy day. Now, verse uh, 16, our intro verse. This is, I think it's a great verse, or it's a, a, a wonderful definition of a worship service. He says, and let the, what, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That kind of sounds like worship. It sounds like a good time. It sounds like an easy time. It sounds like a time where, hey, we lay off the burdens and we come together and sing. Now, you'll go to some churches and, uh, it may look, it, it, it's a little crazy, and you go to some churches, and it's a little bit more somber, um, uh, but uh, you, you worship the Lord. You worship the Lord. There's a right way to do that. Now, God wants us to worship him because, get this, I want you to understand this, worshiping God enriches us, not him. Understand that. When we worship God, we're the ones that get enriched, not him. Now, if you give God your money, did you know God is no richer? When I was a child, we went to First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana with, brother, uh, with Dr. Jack Hiles, and I had a handful of pennies, and the offering plate came by, and I wanted to be involved, you know? I wanted to put my money in the offering. Well, I didn't know how, you know, I didn't know how all of it worked. I thought, as a kid, I was, oh, I had to be six, seven, maybe. I had my money in my hands, and I put it in the offering plate as he walked by, you know? And I thought, how do the ushers get money to God? And I thought in my head at the bank, you know the bank where you'd put the thing in the tube? They don't do that really anymore, I don't think. You'd put it in the tube and it'd go in and go into the bank. I thought maybe they have something like that, you know, for heaven. But God, does, I, God didn't get my pennies. The work of God got my pennies. You see, when you give God your money, you, God doesn't get richer. He owns it all anyway. It's all his anyway. If you give God your, uh, your strength, God's not any stronger. If you give God all your knowledge and wisdom, he doesn't learn anything from you. God is God. So when we give God our strength and our money and our wisdom and our talent, time, talent, treasure, when we give God our abilities, we are the ones that get enriched, not God. We are. Now, um, uh, with this being the case, God wants us to love him and worship him because he is love. The Bible says that God is love. Not that he has it 
or that he gives it, or he has some of it, but that God is love, and love wants to give, and love wants to receive. That's what love is. Love is give and take. Love wants to give, and love wants to receive. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave. For God so loved that he gave. God knows that we become like what we worship. We become like what we worship. If we worship a certain group or a certain um, uh, uh, type of uh, uh, idol or a, a sports, sports is almost a religion in this country, pretty much a religion, God knows that we become like what we worship. If you worship idols, you'll become like idols. If we worship Jesus, we'll become like Jesus. Uh, someone in a, um, what do they call them, worship services. I don't think we've ever called our services worship services. But someone in a, uh, a church service or a worship service or a prayer service might be able to give more than you. You say, uh, well, in what case? Well, someone might be able to sing better than you do. Or someone might be able to understand the word of God or teach the word of God better than you do. But no one, get this, no one can worship God like you do. The Bible says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are your own individual. I know that they say that we have doppelgangers out there, you know. You have somebody who looks like you. But did you know you are the only one in almost 8 billion who has your DNA code? There is no one on this earth that is you. No one. You are fearfully and you are wonderfully made. I have five sons. Each one of them are, they're different. They're different. I don't want Houston to be Lucas. I definitely don't want that. I don't want, I don't. I don't uh, want uh, Hudson to try to act like Lincoln. They're all their own individuals. And each one of them, have, they, we each have our own relationship. There's each a dynamic to each one. And, you know, Hudson's obviously my favorite. And looking back at Lincoln, Lincoln's not even paying attention. Um, I'm, I'm kidding, buddy. I'm kidding. Uh, but I love each one of my kids. And each one of them brings something unique and different. Did you know you bring something unique and different to your relationship with God? Each one of us do. And you can't, so somebody might be able to sing better or dress better or um, uh, serve in a better, high, better capacity or bring in a packed bus or bring in a bunch of visitors or whatever the case is, but only you can worship the Lord like you can. Nobody can do that better than you. Now, it's not your duty to persuade God to bless you. Some of us, we spend so much time in prayer going, dear God, you know, we want blessed of God. That's what we want. I want blessed, I want blessed, I want blessed, I want blessed, I want blessed. You see, but we are the very own, we're our own worst enemy because it's not our job to get God to persuade God to bless us. It's our job to allow Him to bless us. We've got to get out of our own way. You see, if we conform to His book, the Bible says the windows of heaven will open up and He'll pour us out a blessing. That we, the Bible says that we won't even be able to receive it. It's not, it's not persuading Him. Let me live my best life so I can get God. To bless me. No. Live a biblical life so God can bless you. Live the Bible life so God can bless you. God blesses obedience. I called uh, Pastor Alan Domley in Oklahoma City. I called, or just, I think it's Bethel or um, it's Oklahoma City. I called him and I said, um, how do you, you know, what, what do you, how do you get the, you know, the power of God and God's blessing on you? He said, clean living and obedience. I said, okay. Cool. And we talked for a minute and I talked to my dad. I said, dad, you know, when we were running, you know, 300, 400 people, what were you doing? What, how were you doing that? He said, clean living and obedience. I mean, almost to the T different words, but same definition. Whoa. I mean, I'm, okay. All right. Um, clean living and obedience, clean living and obedience. So what is clean living and obedience? Sanctifying the things that you do, making holy the things that you do. Now, like I said, you can't make holy something that is unholy. I cannot sanctify bad thoughts. I cannot sanctify a bad mouth. I can't sanctify a bad, a bad attitude. I can't, you can't sanctify disobedience to your parents or dishonoring your parents. You can't sanctify sin. I spoke about it yesterday in our soul winning meeting about God knows the world that we're living in. Man, we're living in this time, this age, this day. He know, but do you know we, we can walk right? We can walk upright. We can do what's right. We can walk holy in this life that we're living. We don't have to be like the world. The Bible says you got to be in the world but not be of it. Now, it's your duty. It's not your duty to persuade God to bless you but to permit him or allow him to do it. Uh, uh, I think the Bible talks about children many times, even a child. Even a child can come to church. Uh, and praise God and worship God. I think even with a full heart 
or with a pure heart, and in doing so, please God and be blessed. Caden and Kinsey and um, uh, uh, Ryan and Lucas and the kids in primary church, they can come to church with, a, with um, having obeyed mom and obeyed dad and, um, and Colton and purity of heart, and God can look down on those lives and bless those lives. Absolutely. The Bible teaches us to come to God in faith as children. I've said it many times, and, and I guess I'll continue to say it until I don't feel like saying it anymore, is the problem, I think, with our relationship as adults, as, as adults, our relationship with God is the, that very fact that we've become adults with God. We are not adults with God. We are still his children. And we're supposed to still have faith as children. Believing children. Believing children. That, that belief in the magical. The belief in the mystical. The belief in the amazing. Going, I know God hears me. And I know God cares about me. Even though I don't feel it. Even though I don't perceive it. Even though it's been, a, it's been forever since I felt like I've been blessed. God, I haven't had the big and the amazing and the wonderful. So God, since I don't have that now, help me to see the little. Help me to see the benefits that I'm loaded up with every day because your word says that you daily loaded us up with benefits and I'm not seeing them, I'm not perceiving them. God help me because I'm, I'm having a hard time here. And when we will find and continue to walk faithfully in the little and in the secular, listen, I hate being pulled away. I wish every day I could get up and go knock on doors and go witness and go invite people to church and go visit absentees, but God doesn't have me there. So I'm not trying to persuade God to put me there. I'm trying to be blessed where I am today, tomorrow. Don't look past tomorrow or don't look past today. You got to handle today. Tomorrow will take care of itself. God ever wants me to go full time, it'll be on his time, not mine. So I need to and you need to allow God to bless you. And the way that we do that is by sanctifying the secular, making holy where we are. Just as a child comes to church and sings the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand amazed on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. But folks, worship does not end when we leave church. The B-I-B-L-E does not stop when we leave church. Casting all your care upon him does not stop when we leave church. When we walk out of here today, it doesn't stop. It's supposed to extend. It extends to all of our life. Could you imagine if medicine only worked in the hospital? You have to go to the hospital and stay at the hospital until the medicine has run its course and then you can leave. No, no. Man, thank goodness that's not the way it works. Thank goodness they can, they can uh, uh, give me uh, uh, the medicine that I need, whatever treatment that I need, and I can leave. Man, I was the last surgery when I had shoulder surgery. Uh, I was the last surgery scheduled on the day. Uh, I don't remember when it was, 2020, I think. Um, I had surgery, and um, uh, man, almost as soon as I woke up, I was attacked. There was like nine nurses putting me in this harness, forcing pills down my throat, cleaning me up, you know, like, okay, get them out the door. We want to go home. Like, <laughs> I just came out of surgery. Give me a break. And um, uh, no, it wasn't. There was, there was no m maternal anything happening there. It was get out, you know, uh, like kid in the basement, living in the get out, living out of my house, basically. I was the last surgery of the day, and they wanted me out. So they got me out, you know. And um, what they do? They sent, home, they sent me home with medicine. They sent me home with all the things that I needed, but they sent me home. I'm glad I didn't have to stay there. It took me like nine and a half months of rehab to get my shoulder working. And, um, uh, and it still hurts, by the way. Once you get cut open, you're never the same. Um, but uh, uh, it took forever. Could you imagine if I had to stay in the hospital for nine months? Could you imagine if you had to come to church and stay in church until you were spiritually better? I'd be like, are you better yet? Would you leave? <laughs> I got places to go. Uh, you heathen, get out of here. Go find another church. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Um, but um, uh, no, you extend it out. You take church with you. You take worship with you. You take praise with you. You take conviction with you. You take it with you out into the world. You have to live your life. You take it with you. Um, now, real worship exceed, exceeds, uh, excuse me, extends not only um, to every deed, but to every day. Every day, worship in the things that we do. Here's a question. Here's something how you can ask yourself. Is it right? Is it wrong? Can I, can I give God thanks for it? Can I worship him about it? Can I give God thanks for it? Uh, drive a truck. Uh, if I arrive safely at a place, I give God thanks. 
The night that I find a place to park, man, if I can find a good place to park, I give God thanks for it. Even if it's on the side of the road. And that's dangerous. I hate doing it. It's loud. You can't sleep. Highways don't sleep. Um, they're passing you all night long. You can't sleep. You're like, man, this is torture. But I thank God. I thank God for food. I thank God for all the things that I have. Even if God had, I don't feel like God's opened up the windows of heaven and poured me out a blessing. I find things, the little things to thank God for because I want to keep that thankful spirit and that worshiping spirit um, uh, uh, up. I don't want it to get rusty. I don't want it to rust out. I want to keep it ready and worshiping with the Lord. Now, worship extends to every deed every day. Worship is doing everything in the name of Jesus and giving God thanks for it. Giving, uh, or excuse me, worship is doing everything in the name of Jesus and giving God thanks for it. Everything in the name of Jesus and giving God thanks for it. Now, um, those of you who are taking notes, I want you to write down, I will not reference these for sake of time, um, uh, or I'll reference them, but I won't quote them. 1 Peter 4.11, 1 Peter 4.11, and 1 Corinthians 10.31. 10.31. Now, when we take uh, this principle and we take these scriptures and we do these things, the so-called secular is sanctified and every day is edified and God is glorified. You see, somebody asked me one time, we talked for quite some time, and they said, so God wants glorified. What is that to me? I said, because he's the only one that deserves it. Did you know that? He's the only one that deserves it. LeBron James just passed uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar on the uh, number one scoring list. Oh, everybody's glorifying him. He doesn't deserve it. He deserves the work ethic he put in, and that's, he deserves what he earned. He deserves what he earned. I'll say that. Um, rushing records, they deserve what they earned. Touchdown records, they deserve what Kansas City uh, Chiefs just won the Super Bowl. Uh, hey, they, hey what are they, they deserve it, right? They put in the work, the effort, the time, and all that, the sweat equity. They deserve it. Sure, you worked all week. You get your paycheck at the end of the week. You deserve it, don't you? Sure you do. And this person said to me, so, so God wants worshiped. God wants glorified. What is that to me? I said, because he's the only one that deserves it. He's the only one that deserves unending glory, unending love, unending admiration and adoration. He's the only one that deserves it. God is, and God wants to be glorified, but he doesn't just sit up there on his throne with his crown and a scepter and say, glorify me. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro about the whole earth, seeking to show himself strong or glorifiable on those behalf whose hearts are perfect towards him. You see, when we're seeking to give God glory, God will show himself, and God has showed himself, therefore he is worthy of our glory. Sometimes I find it hard to praise God in my prayer time, and I have to go back to the Bible. Now, it's, and I don't find it hard to praise God, understand that. I find it hard to say, God, you didn't open a Red Sea for me lately. You haven't, you know, rained down manna from heaven for me lately. You haven't done any, you know, you didn't walk on water for me lately. You know, so what do I do? I go back to the Bible. And I go back to the past and I say, God, you did this for me in the past and you did this for our church in the past and you did this for my family in the past and you did this for me. But Lord, even if I have nothing at all to thank you for, I thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ and that he rose from the grave and that I'm not dying and going to hell. I don't have to go to hell. It's, a, it's kind of a cocky thing for a Christian to walk around. Now, the world may not, the world doesn't really perceive it, but I conversate, I don't have a problem talking to people uh, in, in the realm of religion or, or, or God or Jesus or anything. And um, uh, in a conversation with more, more of a, not a stranger, a work acquaintance a couple years ago in um, Houston, Texas. And I said, yeah I, yeah, I know God. He had a tattoo right here, God knows war, God knows war. I'm like, what do you know about God? Uh, he can tell me a little bit. I was like, bro, I know God kind of looked at me like I was weird, and I kind of felt weird saying it. <laughs> yeah, I know him. It's like saying, yeah, I, you know, I know, and you name a celebrity. Oh, yeah, we go way back. I'm like, what? You know that guy? You're like, yeah, I know him. Okay, well, I know the guy who started it, and God said, and it was good. In the beginning, God said, I know him. You say, how? That, can a man know God? The Bible says in Jeremiah 9.23, let a man glory in this, that he knoweth and understandeth the Lord. That he knoweth and understandeth the Lord. It's one thing to know somebody. Yeah, I know that person, but to understand them. You know, um, he's not here today. I guess we could all agree on this part. My dad's a pretty unique individual, right? Pretty unique. And if you don't know him, you can be like, 
I don't know how to take what I just heard from this guy. But if you understand him, what happens when we understand people? We give them time and patience and give way to them and give them extra room for extra. We're like, okay, now, if we know God, oh, we know God, God's in heaven. He created all his sons, Jesus Christ, and came and died on the cross to pay for our sins, and he rose from the grave, and he's coming back to get us again. Okay, that old song, song and dance. And I don't mean to just sweep it under the rug, but we own all that. Okay, we know God, but do we understand him? Because when we understand him, we can look at our life from 30,000 feet, so to speak, and go, okay, let me see my life through understanding what God has said about my life. You see, your life isn't some, some uh, unique atom floating in the universe somewhere that has no purpose or plan. God has a purpose and a plan unique for you. First is that all that would come to repentance and be saved. God, wants, God is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. God wants every racist to turn from their ways and get saved. God wants every gangbanger to turn from their ways and get saved. God wants every uh, um, a motorcycle gang member to get saved. God wants every person in prison to get saved. God wants every person in every high tower with all their uh, a million, you know, I don't know about a million dollar suit, but a, 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 a $10,000 suit, $30,000 suit with their um, uh, thousands of dollars worth of jewelry. God wants those people to be saved. God's not against riches. God's against you believing in riches to save you. That's, God's not against that. God's the richest of riches. Get that, understand? The Bible says that the streets of heaven are made out of gold, so pure it almost looks like glass. He's got mates, uh, gates made out of pearl. He has walls made out of every stone and every jasper, every ruber, every ruby that you can imagine. God's not anti-riches. God is anti-you believing in riches. God is pro-Jesus. Get that. God says, believe in Jesus, not riches. Believe in Jesus. None of this other stuff. Believe in Jesus. And when we say, okay, I have believed on Jesus, God says, okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to take this book and live by this book the best you can. I want you to learn it. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The problem with the world is that a whole lot of people have put on one of these or, or got one of these and got one of these and wrongly divided the, wrong, the word of truth. They've taken it and twisted it. Now, when we take the Bible and we rightly divide it, we say, oh, how does that apply to me? What, what can I do? The Bible says, I want you to take my laws into your marriage, into your child rearing, into the way that you work, into the way that you manage, into the way that you use your finances, into your health. I want you to take my laws and my, what I have to say, and I want you, I want you to take my word and live by it. Um, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Joshua 1.8, what did he say? Um, uh, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Oh, what, what else? Uh, Psalm 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit and his season. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Uh, and it goes on, another couple of verses uh, about success, and the ungodly man will find failure. God says, do it my way, and you'll find success. Lose your life for my sake, and you'll find purpose. Find your life, go out on your own and do your own thing, you'll lose your life. You'll lose it. Now, I want to, I find a, it's a balancing act. Going, okay, got to go to life here. Tomorrow, I got to get up and go. Oh, whoa, that was loud. I got to get up tomorrow and go life. We got to go. What are they saying now? I have to adult today. Um, I've been doing it for a long time and um, a moderate long time. And it's been a blast. Um, uh, my knees blasted. My shoulders blasted. My neck's blasted. Um, and it's uh, man, this thing is loud. I'll just hold it out here. Uh, we got to get up and go about our way tomorrow. But I, I want to stress this very quickly. I'm not even going to get close to being done. I'm going to stop in the next three hours and we'll be good. Um, <laughs> false hope, right? Some of you said 10 minutes, 15 minutes. He said three hours. Um, uh, we, it, we take what we gather here together and we take it out there. But this, you don't just come back here and resupply and go back out. I'm all for coming to church and filling and topping the tank off. But you don't come to church. You don't run. You don't go out there and empty the tank spiritually and then come back in here on Sunday and fill up and then go out and empty out. You don't, no, no, no. This is where you top off. This is where you, you, you just top the, the tank off because you're supposed to be filling up during the week out there too. 
uh, our, our the, the, I guess he's my boss, I guess you could say, uh, at work. He says, you know, you know we, have, we will incentivize you to go to some of these smaller fuel stations to get diesel because it's cheaper there. That's fine. I, I do that when I can. Sometimes I can't. Sometimes I have to go to the, the Pilot or the Flying J or the Loves or the TA or the Petro and get fuel at, you know, an arm and a leg. Uh, and uh, sometimes I can find the, the cheap fuel. Um, but uh, anytime I've got half a tank and I'm passing a speedway and they've got it for three fifty five dollars in Missouri, guess what I'm doing? Oh, I've got half a tank. I'm fine. Nope. I pull over and get it for three fifty five dollars a gallon because then I don't know where I'm going. The next place I'm going, it could be, um, uh, let's see, uh, let's go, oh, Indiana, four eighty nine dollars a gallon. I'd come back to Indiana and, ha- and I have to get it at four eighty nine dollars a gallon? No. Okay, so you're out there in the world. Hey, three rivers, ba- three rivers on Sunday mornings, three fifty five dollars a gallon. You're out in the world, secular, you're paying the dues. You have got to get on your knees and pray. The pastor's not going to encourage you to do it. You have to open up your Bible and find some, tru- some truth from God. You've got to feed yourself. The pastor, the pastor is, is serving you on Sunday. How can I spoon feed you this morning? And I don't mean y'all are a bunch of babies, but I'm saying it's, it's easy. You got to just sit there and listen. I've done the study. I've done the reading. I've done the looking. I've done the praying. And all you got to do is come in and soak it up. Out there, you're on your own. You have got to do it. Out there, it's five bucks a gallon. In here, it's three fifty-five. So when you go out there, you've got to keep that tank full. Sunday, let's start the week off right. Let's get in here. Let's top off. Let's get things right. Let's make sure I'm ready to go out and face the secular world and take what I'm getting today out into the secular world. And then the things that you pick up out there. Man, did you know when you come into church, you're supposed to share? And I don't mean get up and testify. When the preacher's preaching, sit down. Let's share after church or something. Uh, but, uh, man, you wouldn't believe how, you know, the answer, to, the answer to prayer that God gave me this week. Some people walk in on, whoa, man, God did big things this week, and God worked in my life, and God led me in a new direction. He got me a new job and all these, whatever the case. And then some people walk in. The Bible says, bear ye one another's burdens. So some people walk in burdened. That's what church is also. Church is a place where we help bear burdens, but we also testify and worship and share God's, uh, God's uh, blessings in our life. But that's what it is. It's not a one-stop Sunday morning and then go out and forget about everything during the week. Many make that mistake of wanting to divide life up like a pie. Oh, cut it up, cut it up. We allot certain slices and certain, certain portions to God, um, like one-tenth of our money we give to God or uh, one-seventh of our week we give to God. But the thing is, is God judges your life, or when God judges your life, he's going to judge the whole pie, not just the pieces. He's going to judge the whole thing. Why? Because it all belongs to him anyway. It's all his anyway. Every breath I take, every, every uh, move I make, every, uh, <laughs> every <laughs> I couldn't help it, folks. I was trying to think of the next thing to say. Uh, but every, um, uh, everything I do, Everything. God says, I, I evaluate that. I judge that. Now, I need, I'm going to close early. Um, and if you have kids in primary church, let them run their course. Please don't go knock on the door. I'd hate to see Brother Pohazi in his elderly age whoop you. Uh, so <laughs> leave Brother Pohazi and Ms. Pohazi alone. Um, so it's all going to be judged. It's all, it's all going to be judged. And as I said earlier, we, we all think, you know, we're going to stand before God and God's going to go, okay, let me, evade, let me pull out my, you know, let me, you know, I'm going to do this. Back on. Are we back on? God's going to, oh, can I reach that? Ugh. There we go. Now just pretend with me, okay? Okay, there we go. So here you are, your life is on this screen, Okay. Here we are, There's, you can picture what you want on there. So here you are, your life is on this screen, and God kind of gets up, you know, and looks at, his, looks at the screen and goes, hmm, yeah, I see some pretty bad things on there, but, you know, those disqualify you from heaven. Let me tell you this right now. If you have one mark, one mark on your sheet, you're hellbound. One. Some people have millions. Millions. You know, did I had millions? I did, you did, maybe some of you do. But unless your sheet, unless your rap sheet 
is squeaky clean, you're going to die and go to hell. We go, whoa, whoa. Once I have something on my ledger, once I have something on my rap sheet, how does it get expunged? What do I do to get my record expunged, God? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For his blood washes away all our sin. The Bible says where sin did abound, where a rap sheet full of felonies, spiritual felonies did abound. I love this verse. Grace did much more abound. Grace did much more abound. Now, I, here's the confidence that we have in, the, in, in God's word. I, as a trusting faith-based, Jesus-believing uh, a, a Christian, born-again Christian here on earth, I don't ever have to stand before God and wring my hands going, man, I hope my record's clean. I know it's clean today. I know it is today. And the people who don't know their record is clean today will not have the chance to stand before God and review their record in do you get to go to heaven or to hell. You decide about eternity while you're living. You, there is no, there is no, you don't die and go to hell and then die and go to hell. I know the Bible says that this is the second death and death and hell were cast lake of fire. This is the second death. But you don't get out and say, oh man, I paid my dues and get out. No, that, there's no purgatory. There's no limbo. There's no soul sleep. The Bible says absent from the body, present with the Lord. That's if you're saved. If you're not saved, you die and go to hell. Now, you have two judgments in the Bible. Number one is the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is where Christians will go and God says, let me evaluate your life. Was your life, did your life, Christian, son, child, daughter, did your life consist of wood, hay, stubble? You say, what's wood, hay, stubble? Things done on earth for earth. That's wood, hay, stubble. Or is it gold, silver, precious stone? And I'm using biblical scripture terminology here. Um, uh, wood, hay, stubble, things done on earth for earth, or gold, silver, precious stones things done on earth for heaven. That's what the Christian life is, living that life. The Bible says that those things, all of our works will be tried by fire. Whatever remains is our, is our reward. Okay, that's the judgment seat of Christ. Well, then we have a second judgment. That second judgment is called the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment. That is where all the unbelieving, that is where hell is brought up to stand before judgment of God. Everybody that has believed or turned or rejected Jesus Christ, God says, I will judge them. And just as we are rewarded for our works, people will be into eternal damnation. I believe the Bible teaches, um, let's just put it this way. Uh, some, are gonna, some are going to, some are going to uh, uh, suffer more in hell than others. Some flame is hotter than other flame. Um, now, without diving too far into that, maybe a whole nother message, uh, which judgment are you going to be at? If I'm at the great white throne judgment, you know what it's going to be for? A witness. I'll be there as a witness. That fellow that I told you about, I knocked on his door and he took that gospel track and threw it down at my feet, said, I don't want your blankety blank and trash. Oh, okay. And he went inside his door and slammed the door and I got it and ironed out and walked back up to his door and knocked on the door. He said, you didn't do that. Yeah, I did. And I said, hey. And he said, ah, and he kind of got in my face. And I said, you're going to regret that. He said, what are you going to do about it? I said, nothing, man. I ain't going to do nothing. Just letting you know he is. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm not trying to beat people over the head with my religion. You see, people are okay with your religion as long as you leave them alone about it. Real religion that contains real truth will not leave them alone about it. But I might annoy them. Better to annoy them and be justified at the judgment as a witness than them look you in your eyes and say, dude, why didn't you tell me? Hey, man, I did tell you. I told you five, six, seven times. You can't look at me and tell me and tell me I didn't tell you. There are people, I, I don't know that I'll ever meet them again, and I didn't tell them. And there are people that I would know, I did tell you. I told you. I told you. You're not holding me accountable. I told you. Jesus Christ would save you just like you are, right where you are. See, a lot of religion, they want you to clean your life up to be saved. You can't. 
You see, the, one that ha- one, the, the cleaner has to come in before you clean up. The cleaner has got to come in to help you do the cleaning. Otherwise, it was just an outside cleaning. Houston and I drove by a place this afternoon or this morning. Outside of it's trashed, embarrassing, trashed, trashed on the outside. And he said, well, I'd rather have the outside look like that than the inside. I said, yeah, but if the outside looks like that, I can guarantee you the inside looks worse. The outside's trashed. The inside's filthy. It's dirty outside. It's filthy inside. I said, but what happens is, is you got to let Jesus come in and clean up inside. Outside always follows. Man's religion says, clean up the outside so you can allow Jesus to come in. If my dirtiness stops the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-sufficient God from entering into me, then he isn't God. If the little bit of sin stands in the way, the only thing that stands in the way is saying, no, God, you can't come in. But to any man that says, any man that comes to me, he said, I will in no wise cast out. I don't care if you're smoking, drinking, fighting, cussing, watching things you shouldn't watch things that are bad for you physically and mentally, that full of violence. I don't care where you are. I don't care where on earth you are. I don't care what your condition is, what your problems are. If you come to me, I won't cast you out. He'll save you. And then if you are saved and you found yourself away from him backslidden, he says, come to me. Let's start it over again. Let's start again today. Sanctify today. Make today holy. Start again today. And then when you leave here, Start, if you're married, start with your, your relationship. You have kids, begin with your kids. Take it to work tomorrow. Say, you know what? I'm working, I'm welding, I'm driving a truck, I'm writing a book, I'm doing whatever I do. I'm doing it like God is the one sitting in that office. I'm doing it like God is the one who runs this company. I'm doing it for him. Sanctify the secular. Sanctify the secular not just on Sundays. So you can ask yourself this, is what I'm doing consistent with the personality of Jesus Christ? Is what I'm doing and how I'm acting consistent with who Jesus is? If it's not, then there's probably room for us to improve. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? What is worship on Monday morning? It's doing everything in the name of Jesus and giving God thanks for it. That's worship. Monday morning worship, Tuesday morning worship, worship, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, all the way throughout the week and again on Sunday. Now, wherever you go, whatever you do, when we all sanctify things throughout our week, when we do that, every day is a holy day. Oh, Sunday's a holy day. No, every day is. Every place is a holy place. It's a sacred place. And we can sanctify the secular And every day is edified and God is glorified. Now, if you can't do anything in the name of Jesus, um, reevaluate it. And you can't do anything in the name of Jesus if you aren't saved. You've got to be saved first. So I want to ask you, everybody's heads bows, everybody's eyes closed. I don't know your heart. I do not know your heart. I know you. But I may not understand you fully. I mean, I don't, I don't know everybody in here. I don't know everybody's testimony. Let me ask you, do you know Jesus personally? Do you know him personally? Have you said, I have believed on Jesus Christ? I, I understand that he's the way, the truth, the life. I, want, I believe on Jesus. I'm not quite sure I've ever heard to put my faith in anything. But today, I'm going to put it in Jesus. I'm going to ask you this morning, if you don't know, If you do not know for sure that you would go to heaven, but you want to nail it down today, just like Sean's boys did last week, just like six people did last week, if you say, I want to know for sure, I don't want to leave this building today without knowing what God has to say about getting to heaven forever. I want to know about that. Is there anybody in the room like that? Nobody's looking around. Would you show me? Would you show me your hand? Anybody? Okay. I'm looking intently. No. Okay, good. I mean, everybody in here, you're either lying to yourself or you said, I am a born-again Christian. I have believed on Jesus Christ, and I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven according to God's own promises. If that's the case, then take church 
with you. When's the last time you talked to the Lord confidently and personally? If you're not, now if you didn't, if you, if you, if you didn't raise your hand and you needed to, then you need to ask Jesus today. Call on Jesus today. Return, re, repent from unbelieving and turn to Jesus. Ask Jesus Christ to forgive you. Ask him into your heart. Ask him into your life, and he'll save you. Now, folks, our world is messed up and crazy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray in just a moment. And uh, after I pray, Miss Jennifer is going, going to begin to, uh, to play the piano. And when she does, I want you to come forward. I want you, those of you who come forward and pray here at the altar, make a commitment today. And if you, if you mess up, start again. Just start over and over and over again. Adjustment falls, times, seven, falls seven times and rises again. If you mess up, get it right. Let's start sanctifying what we do. Can we do what we do? Can we live the life that we live in the name of Jesus? Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you'd help us. Lord, help our church, help our families, our husbands and wives and children. Uh, as workers in a secular world, Lord, we live in this, this uh, secular world, a carnal world, and we war every day against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Lord, I'd ask that you'd help us to be that peculiar people we're told to be, um, a, a people of light, where people look and, and say, man, there is something different about these people or something that's different about my husband or my wife or my, my son or my daughter. And we can tell them, oh, yeah, it's Jesus that makes the difference. Jesus makes the difference. Lord, help us not to be um, hypocrites and be uh, high and holy on Sunday and then walk out into the world and there be no difference. Heavenly Father, as we walk with you and talk with you, make a difference in us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Miss Jennifer, would you begin to play? Just sanctify every day. I need to, being out on the road. And I got to sanctify every single day. Every day matters. Every day is important. Oh, church on Sunday. What about church on Monday? Church on Tuesday. Oh, sure, we've got the church building here. This is the church building. But really, we are. The Holy Spirit of God lives inside of us. We are the church. We are. Right, you can stay standing. Uh, if you're not standing, you can stand or sit. It doesn't really matter. Miss Sarah's going to come sing us out of here. Uh, and then um, tonight at 5 o'clock, we've got our evening service. And then um, uh, tomorrow, start of our work week, so to speak. Uh, and every little thing we do, every little decision. Um, somebody said, just try to put God at the forefront of everything you do. It's hard. Man, it's hard. I mean, I love God. I think everybody, oh, yeah, I, I love God. It's putting them first in everything, man, because this flesh, this flesh is something else uh, uh, to deal with. And um, sometimes I'm my own worst enemy, uh, but God is patient. Lamentations chapter three, uh, he says he's, and his mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. I'm so glad we serve a God and God is a God who does not fail his word and his promises. Because if he, if he did, we'd, I'd be dead. I can't speak for everybody else, but I'd, I'd, I'd have a surely screwed up life. Um, so I thank God for his mercy 
And um, uh, I didn't, we didn't recognize them earlier, but um, uh, and I, we don't have to like, I mean, who, who came and shook uh, Brother um, Paul's hand? Anybody come and shake his hand? Okay, good. Brother Paul, Warden, right? Warren. Okay, I was thinking Warden. Oh, Ward. Oh, Ward. Oh, okay. For some reason, I wasn't thinking Warden. I guess that's where I would have ended up. Um, but um, Ward, Paul Ward is uh, uh, Joe and Renee's visitor, and he's doing some uh, uh, work for him. So glad to have him with us this morning. And um, uh, uh, let's see. Am I forgetting anything? I don't think so. All right, come sing us out, Miss Sarah. <laughs> 